Welcome. I'm Karen Love Basinger, the pastor of Florence United Methodist Church on the Oregon coast. We're delighted to have you here with us today, and we pray this will be a time of um, great meaning as you grapple with uh, why, who you are and why you are and what your purpose is and whose you are. So welcome. Glad you're here. Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care 
for lives saved and lives lost for showing up either way. Praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if ever there was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists working a way to understand the thing that plagues us to find an antidote and all the medicine makers. Praise be the journalists keeping us informed. Praise be the teachers finding new ways to educate children from afar and blessings on parents holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health, praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers, the homeless and refugees. Praise for the artists and poets, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind, bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown gnawing. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. Praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones and your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean, each time a baptism. Praise every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance and slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. Praise for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this has passed, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin.
The scripture this morning we take from Paul's letter to the Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our life on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same Spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I believe that the present sufferings are nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice. It was the choice of the one who subjected it, but in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole creation is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now. And it's not only the creation. We ourselves, who have the Spirit, as the first crop of the harvest, also groan inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. May the Lord add the blessing to the word as we have read it. Today I'm sharing the first of four messages on the theme of hope in the midst of what in biblical terms would be a plague, which surely the COVID-19 pandemic qualifies itself to be called. I'm going to connect the messages of two great Christian souls, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Rome and the great mystic Lady Julian of Norwich, who lived during the second of three horrific waves of a global pandemic, the bubonic plague in the mid 15th century. In Romans 8, 1 through 11, our lectionary reading for last week, Paul declares that God empowers us, he empowers us to live out our lives in Christ through the Spirit. 
Since God has delivered us, we are able to live out our lives with conscious attention to the things of the indwelling spirit, God's ways, rather than the things of the flesh, our ways, which is what in the 12-step fellowships they would call self-will run riot. Self-will run riot. We are to let God transform our lives. Uh, see Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's possible for us to live a Christ-like life. When we make a commitment to become a Christ follower, then we dedicate ourselves to putting on the character of Christ, becoming part of his body, dying with him and rising with him through the sacrament of baptism, spiritual transformation that only happens as each essential dimension of the human being dies to self-will and is transformed to Christ-likeness under the direction of our regenerated will instead of our self-will run riot. And that regenerated will interacts with constant overtures of grace from God. We get a lot of help from the Apostle Paul. For the Apostle Paul, being in Christ involves much more than mere membership in a church. It's a reality that transforms human beings from the inside out. God is our hope because it's God who's doing the transforming. In Romans 8, 12 through 25, our reading for today, impatience was being felt by the Christians of the first century to whom the Apostle Paul wrote his letters. They, like each of us, wanted quick results and clear benefits, but Paul challenges them to take a longer-term view. I consider that the sufferings of this present time, he says, are not worth comparing with the glory, with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. He says that in Romans 8:18, 8, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we are saved. Verses 22 to 24. Now you've heard that old fitness mantra, no pain, no gain. Well, Paul takes it a step further. He's saying, no groan, no gain. Before we can see the glory of God, we have to endure the anxiety, stress, and sufferings of the present times. Before we can receive our complete adoption as children of God, we have to groan in sometimes excruciating labor pains. And before we can see the completion of God's plan for us and for all of creation, we have to wait with patience, says Paul, and hope for what we do not see. Hope for what we do not see, verse 25. By hope we are saved, says Paul. There are no spiritual shortcuts or bypasses. So the challenge for us is to turn away from false hope and turn toward true, true hope, to put no confidence in ourselves, in and of ourselves, but to look steadily beyond ourselves to find the fulfillment of our own selves, our true selves and actions in God. False hope is life in the flesh or in the world, says Paul, a life of trying to work out our own salvation by what, as I mentioned earlier, is called self-will run riot, a life where it's uh, the 12 steppers say, my best thinking got me here. A life that inevitably leads to defeat and death, no matter how hard you're trying in and of your own efforts. But true hope is life in the spirit, being in Christ, an approach that puts d to death the deeds of the body of the worldly uh, condition and gives new life. True hope is found when we focus on the fact that we are children of God people who will surely have to endure, endure some suffering with Christ, but, but we will also be glorified with him, verses 13 to 17. True hope knows the truth of the maxim, no groan, no gain. Paul sees the present age as a training period, a kind of exerting energy and producing sweat period. During this time of hard work, he wants us to take courage, both from the prospect of future glory and from the assistance, all the help that we're already given by the Holy Spirit. As we look forward to being set free from our bondage to decay, we have the comfort of knowing that God is with us in spirit and that that, help, that spirit helps us in our weakness in uh, verse 26, giving us healing and strength and wisdom and courage. We should be thankful that God in Christ does not force us to face the sufferings 
of the present time, the anxieties on our own, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the companionship of our brothers and sisters in Christ can make these workouts of this earthly training period a lot more bearable. Now, from a more, for a more feminine perspective, let's turn from Paul to an amazing woman who's been called uh, a mystic for our times, Lady Julian of Norwich. Julian lived during the second of three waves of the bubonic plague, horrible disease. According to History.com, the five most devastating pandemics in human history were three waves of the bubonic plague that took place um, over about 16 centuries and then caused by a single bacterium, Yersinia pestis, a fatal infection, otherwise known as the plague, a pan and then the other two uh, really bad uh, pandemics were smallpox and a bout of chlor uh, cholera. The plague of Justinian, uh, the first bout of uh, bubonic plague, arrived in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, in 541 uh, Christian era. It was carried over the Mediterranean Sea from Egypt, which was a re recently conquered land, conquered by Rome, paying tribute to uh, Emperor Justinian in grain. Well, there were plague-ridden fleas that hitched a ride on the black rats that snacked on the grain. So the plague decimated Constantinople and spread like wildfire across Europe, Asia, North Africa, and Arabia, killing an estimated 30 to 50 million people perhaps half of the known world's population at that point. People had no real understanding of how to fight it other than trying to avoid sick people, says uh, Dr. Thomas Makaitis, a history professor at DePaul University. He said, as to how the plague ended, the best guess is that the majority of the people in the pandemic somehow survive and those who survive have immunity. The plague never really went away and it came back 800 years later and it killed with reckless abandon. It was called the Black Death this time, and it hit Europe in 1347, and in four years, it claimed 200 million lives. Julian uh, of Norwich lived from 1342 to 1416, and she experienced 16 visions, or showings, as she called them, all on one May night in 1373 when she was very sick and near death from the bubonic plague. A priest held a crucifix in front of her and Julian saw Jesus suffering on the cross and she heard him speaking to her for several hours. In her near death experience, she realized like all mystics that, Jesus was, that what Jesus was saying about himself he was simultaneously saying about all of reality. And that's what unitive consciousness allows you to see, explains contemporary mystic and contemplative Father Richard Rohr. Now, after she survived this experience, this near-death experience, she felt the need to go apart and reflect on her profound experience. She asked the bishop to enclose her in a little cell. In, uh, it was called, back then it was called an anchor hold. It was built against the side of St. Julian's Church in Norwich, England. She was later named after that church. We don't even know her name. We call her Lady, and then the church's name. Lady, it would be like calling us Lady Florence United Methodist Church. Um, we do not know her real name because she never signed her writings. And Richard Rohr says, talk about loss of ego. She was so in union with Christ, her name did not even matter to her. The anchor hold, or the little cell, had on one side, it had a window into the church that allowed her to attend mass, and another window so that she could counsel and pray over people who came to visit her. Such anchor holds were found all over 13th and 14th century Europe, and devout Christians who lived in them, they were called anchorites. Julian first wrote a short text about the showings, but then she's patiently spent 20 years in contemplation and prayer, trusting God to help her discern the deeper meaning to be found in those visions. Finally, she wrote a longer text titled Revelations of Divine Love. Julian's interpretation of her God, -like, of her God experience is unlike what people were thinking theologically the religious views common 
uh, for most of the history up to her time, it her her experience was not based in sin and shame and guilt and fear of God or hell. Instead, it was full of delight and freedom and intimacy and cosmic hope. Now, how did she retain such freedom, we might ask? Well, maybe, says Father Rohr, it's because she was not a priest and she didn't have to stick to a party line and try to please the congregation. All she did was speak from her direct experience of these deep periods of communion, these long periods of prayer uh, and communion with Christ. Now, Father Rohr says that when he reads her words now, what strikes him is the similarity between Julian's time and our own time. And here's what another author, scholar, and Episcopal priest, Mary Earle, describes as Julian's 14th century context. Julian lived at a time of vast social, religious, and political upheaval, incessant wars, and sweeping epidemics. Norwich, with a population of around 25,000 by 1330, was struck viciously by this plague known as the Black Death. At its peak in the late 1340s in England, it killed three-fourths of the population of that little town. A young girl at this time, she was certainly affected in untold ways by this devastation. And when the plague returned, she was about 19. In her anchor hold, she may have recognized that, hey, you know, it's not a bad thing to practice social distancing in the middle of this. Because they did understand that being close to sick people could um, increase your chances dramatically of getting sick. And so she was, but then through this awakened ability to, through solitude, to be personally present to divine love, uh, she was doubly blessed. Yet we must remember that she also let love's fl let God's love flow right through her to those on the street who would request her counsel and show up at her little window. And then she had her writings that help us share in the gifts that she received spiritually during that time. Now, although Julian of Norwich is an anonymous woman who lived over 600 years ago, seekers and scholars return to her showings again and again. Veronica, author Veronica Mary Rolfe describes why Julian's wisdom is perennial, perennial, valuable, and needed wherever there is confusion and suffering, which is to say all the time, because in every time and place, there's confusion and suffering. Rolf writes, perhaps the best answer to the question, why Julian now, is that in our age of uncertainty, inconceivable suffering, and seemingly violence and war, not unlike 14th century Europe, Julian shows us the way toward contemplative peace and hope. In a world of deadly diseases and ecological disasters, Julian teaches us how to endure pain in patience and trust that Christ is working to transform every cross into resurrected glory. Moreover, across six centuries, Julian's voice speaks to us about love. She communicates personally as if she's still very much with us here and now. It's like she went beyond time and space. Even though more than theological explanations, we all hunger for love. Our hearts are yearning for somebody we can trust absolutely, divine love that can never fail. And Julian's writings reveal this love because like Mary Magdalene, she experienced it firsthand. Precisely because she had the courage of her convictions, Julian of Norwich became the first woman ever to write a book in the English language. Even more, this unlettered woman developed a mystical theology that was second to none in the 14th century and that continues to break down barriers uh, in our own time. She was also emotionally raw, and she was very honest about that, very tempted by self-doubt and discouragement. I mean, she went through hard times emotionally in the midst of all this bubonic plague, and, but yet she was constantly renewed in hope. It was like, like we're experiencing, many of us, we're on this roller coaster, you know? And so she would go down into that discouragement and self-doubt, and then she would touch Christ again and go up in hope. She does something extremely dangerous for a person, a lay person living in the 14th century. She disclosed her conflict, 
her inner struggling with the predominant medieval idea of a judgmental and wrathful God and her direct experience of the unconditional love, the all-encompassing love of Christ on the cross. So why is she so appealing and relevant today? She's totally transparent and vulnerable, honest, without any guile, no pretense. She's what in medieval terms would be called homely. That is, down to earth, familiar, easily accessible. She's honest to God. She's keenly aware of her spiritual brokenness and she longs to be healed. So do we. And she experiences great suffering of body, mind, and soul. So do we. And she has moments of doubt. So do we. And she, she seeks answers to age-old questions. So do we. Then, at the critical turning point in her revelations, she's overwhelmed by joy and what she calls gramercy. Great thanks for the graces she is receiving. We, too, on this roller coaster that we're, many, so many of us are on, is like, we, we you know, we go from, uh, like, Alan, I'll be sitting there at, 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 the, at a meal, and we'll just be so grateful for all the blessings that we have. And then, you know, a little while later, we're freaked out about the pandemic or other challenges. We're so, but we too are suddenly granted graces and, and this awareness of how blessed we are and we're filled to overflowing with gratitude. And then sometimes we even experience our own divine revelations. So again and again, Julian reassures each of us that we are loved. We are so loved by God unconditionally. And in her writings, we hear Christ telling us just as he told her, and she shares with us, I love you, and you love me, and our love shall never be separated in two. So in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul and the great mystic Lady Julian of Norwich, let's focus on living in Christ this week, which is our saving hope. Let our homes be where we are doing our best to do no harm to ourselves or others by helping contain the the COVID-19 virus through physical distancing as hard as it is. And I pray that we take advantage of this opportunity to deepen spiritually. We are stuck at home. Julian had her anchors hold, her cell. We have our homes. We can make them like our monasteries or our anchor hold so that when we're asked after this to which shall pass, well, what did you do during the pandemic? You can realize the blessings that were in the curse, how God redeemed this really tragic situation, and be grateful that God used this time in your life, in our lives, to bring us into fuller Christ-likeness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good everybody. We're sitting here on a sub cloudy day enjoying it. This is about all we can do in life today, but it's good to see who we do on Sundays. And we have enjoyed the church message that we get on the internet, and we can't wait till we can get back and see everybody. We love you and miss you very much. Me too. <laughs> I'd like to say we miss all of you. Uh, Pastor Carol, we, Karen, we miss you so much. And Alan too, <laughs> when he tags along. I miss being in the choir and uh, entertaining everybody. <laughs> uh, we just miss our church life. And we'll be awfully glad to get back to it if this thing ever comes to a, to a head. Uh, I appreciate if all of you would having your prayers that uh, they find a, a vaccine for the uh, virus and uh, get everything straightened out so that we can get back to our normal lives and uh, pray to God the way we always do together. We love you all. Be looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hello to everybody at United, Florence United Methodist Church. This is Pat in a position that I never thought I would be in, of course. And uh,
today is Friday when I'm recording this, and they, I was able, when I took my exercise with uh, physical therapy, I walked 340 feet. So that feels pretty good. You're worn out, but I'm not hurting. I had three falls, and I'm not hurting anywhere. I got a few bruises, but that's it. So anyway, missing church, but I'm sure everybody is. And have a good Sunday. And I'll be back soon. Hi, uh, this is Sandy and Terry Woodward wishing all of you a very good day. And we wish we were all worshiping together. Uh, and we hope to do it soon. We miss all of you. Um, your turn. Thank you, Kathy Waterman, and also the Nurture Committee. I received the flowers this morning, and they are lovely. I didn't mind do it. I hope Donna enjoys what she's going to be doing and taking over. And look at the church, how well it's been painted and everything. Okay, well, we'll hope to see you soon. Wave. <laughs> Hello Knights, my name is Bree and welcome to your at-home Knights of North Castle VBS. Today we're going to learn some awesome dances, we're going to do some crafts, some science experiments, and you're going to get your first quest from our armorer and ice-breathing dragon, Sparky. Welcome to North Castle. Hear these words of blessing and benediction. 
Through Jesus, we have come to know ourselves as children of God. And so St. Paul says, all who are guided by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. And if we are children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Our inheritance is not gold or jewels or mansions or fast cars. Our inheritance is a life liberated from the darkness of self-centeredness and purposelessness. We are children of light and love in our union with Christ. All praise and glory are yours, our gracious God. We are your children. May we play before you laughing and full. And in the name of our Creator, our Christ and Holy Spirit, Amen. Alleluia. And God will reign.